Mom, Dad, I humbly suggest you save some money and shop Amazon for back to school. It's for my growth, meaning my body's growing at an alarming rate. And clothes you buy me this year will be very small very soon. Plus, the clothes I love today will be out of style tomorrow. But at least your wallet doesn't have to be my fashion victim if you shop low prices for school at Amazon. Hopefully this is helpful. Amazon. Spend less, smile more. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today, I'm going to be talking about how marriage changes at midlife. Um, and there's interesting framing for that, which you may remember if you ever took a developmental psych class. And I'm going to talk about Eric Erickson for a little bit. Um, Before we get to that, please do subscribe. Most recent subscriber episode was about if you are a goofball, this may not be associated with a great marriage later on. And um, there's over 157 others, and you get those all for $8.99 a month if you subscribe. And the link is always in my episode description. Okay, so as people move through developmental stages, there so there's lots of developmental stages, and it's so funny because people will definitely endorse that children change, and I talk about this a lot. If you've been a parent, of course you know that, like, your six-year-old is going to have different motivations than your two-year-old and that your 16-year-old is going to act like neither of those and is going to be a teenager with these central, you know, with this identity crisis. Who am I going to be? How am I going to fit into the world? Am I, you know, appealing to friends and potentially significant others, etc.? You know, but your six-year-old is not going to be thinking like that, right? And All of that basic understanding about how people change and grow developmentally kind of just changes in adulthood, such that adults sometimes act like all of adulthood is one stage and there's no more development going on. And this isn't right, you know. And so one way to think about this is Eric Erickson has developmental stages, eight developmental stages. You can Google them, but the ones that we're going to be talking about are The 20s and 30s are the intimacy versus isolation stage. So he basically says there's one good outcome and one bad outcome. And the central question of the person at that stage is, will I be loved? So do you achieve intimacy, such as like a significant other, a family, etc.? Or are you alone and isolated? And then... At 40, interestingly, because, you know, talking about midlife is very uh, something I've done a lot as I am in my 40s, my early 40s. Now I've talked and so are so many of my clients at 40. There there seems to be a switch. And it was interesting that this was even exactly when Erickson, when I went back and looked at his stages, this is exactly when he says that there's a switch to generativity versus despair how can I contribute to the world becomes the central question in your 40s and 50s. And at at 65, people look back at their lives and they reflect on whether it was meaningful or not. But that's not the stage that most of my listeners are at yet. So most of my listeners are transitioning from the focus on intimacy versus isolation to the focus on generativity versus despair. Now, it's interesting because I feel, and this is not something that Erickson said, and I'm certainly not going back into the uh, deep annals of, uh, you know, developmental psych, or he was actually an ego psychologist is what he was called, um, more psychoanalytic framing there. But uh, I'm not going back to the source there, but I don't know if he said this, but from what I see in my practice, people can say stay stuck at earlier levels if they were traumatized or if they have unresolved issues. So just like your kids, right? So just like kids who do not feel confident in moving out of the house, right? They have trouble. They didn't really like resolve the central issues of like being a teenager. They didn't develop confidence. They didn't develop kind of a healthy risk taking. Instead, they are more anxious and they do not feel like they could succeed. This is like called failure to launch, you know? 
And so it's obvious that if somebody does not resolve the central conflicts, oh, now that I'm saying it, I remember this, if you don't resolve the central conflicts of one, then it's hard to go to the next stage, right? So it it really, really plays out in the couples that I see where the guy, let's say, the preoccupied attachment guy is in his like mid 40s but he's still tr- in the intimacy versus isolation phase because he had unresolved childhood issues you know where he had low self esteem he didn't really think of himself as you know that valuable or didn't develop self-worth so then he kind of coupled himself with an avoidant woman and he's been chasing intimacy versus isolation within that relationship for like 20 years and so instead of his focus kind of changing in his 40s to something like what am I going to build you know in my life like how how am I going to be as a father what am I going to do next at work how am I going to make a mark on this world what's my legacy going to be instead he becomes obsessed still or he remains rather obsessed with the relationship And obviously there are preoccupied or fearful avoidant. Either one of those is going to be super obsessed with the relationship at times. Women as well, obviously, more so, as I frequently say, there's there's more preoccupied attachment women than men, irrespective of what you see on the internet. So a woman who never really felt like her husband was reachable, who felt like her marriage is constantly uh, kind of unfulfilled on a basic level because he he's focused out on work and on uh, hobbies and friends and and not on her. She kind of remains stuck almost in that stage. I mean, in her forties or even fifties. Although there is a change, and I talk about this a lot, when your hormones go down, there are superordinate biological variables that, you know, illuminate this in a different way. So he has the psychosocial stages of development, but there's also biology as as a backdrop to all of this, you know. Um, But some women still, despite their hormones, you know, attenuating and the estrogen dropping and the caretaking going away, they still remain obsessed with whether, uh, like, the getting the attention of their avoidant husband and whether this is the right relationship and whether they should leave, et cetera, et cetera. And so versus, and of course, what does that stop them from doing? It stops them from moving into a different stage where they're saying, how can I make my mark on the world, on my community? How can I care for and mentor others? Women do that very frequently with their own children. But basically, and I tell this to people all the time in therapy without using this construct, um, if you're obsessed with your relationship, what else are you doing? And I have a podcast on that, the real reason women don't respect preoccupied attachment men. And I discuss because like, what else are they doing? What else are they doing in the world? They're so obsessed with you. But how does that allow them the brain space to focus on other things that are actually meaningful and admirable? So, yes, of course, it's meaningful to have a loving relationship, but there are other things in the world as well. And at midlife, people start turning from this inner focus of how can I get my needs met to more of an outer focus of how can I meet the needs of others. Um, And not just the kids, because for women, they've been meeting the needs of the kids and the dads have to increasingly, obviously, um, or as I discuss the younger men are doing at least half a lot of the people I see are doing half but either way women have more of a central identity based on being a caregiver but that doesn't mean that they feel like they are leaving a legacy necessarily particularly as your children hit the teenage years when you are in midlife you may think that they're acting terribly and that you know what was it all for all of the you know being around and being present and driving them to stuff and you know, making all the nice holidays and trips if they don't really act, you know, very, very nice to you. So at that point, women frequently want more meaning in their life. And it's very healthy to do so. And my point is that this is a healthy transition at midlife to instead of focus everything on how often we're having sex, how many date nights we're having, that's really not salient to a lot of people the same way. They want to do, they, life is fleeting. That becomes very, obvious the older you get and so at midlife people want more than happiness they want meaning they want a deeper fulfillment 
a good book to read about this uh, topic in general, and I'm going to be talking about this in the next podcast too, is uh, The Second Mountain by David Brooks. Uh, He talks a lot about this transition. He doesn't focus it on any specific age, but the transition from he calls the first mountain when you're pursuing happiness and things that are more self-interested. And then the second mountain that you get to later in life is when you start to focus on how can you help the world and how can you bring meaning to the world and what is your legacy going to be. And then you have moments of joy, which is uh, more transcendental than happiness, which is something that is very, very key in many schools of you know, psychotherapy, many approaches such as acceptance and commitment therapy, where basically you can't ever predict how you're going to feel. So you got to accept that. And then you have to go live a valued life, a life in accordance with your values, no matter how you feel, which is a different way of thinking about it, especially for people who struggle with depression, where you can never tell, you know, how you're going to feel if you're going to be sad or happy or, or what have you that day. And I'm going to talk about that more in the next podcast. But back to the, the marriage thing. So I'm certainly not saying that in your 40s and 50s, people don't have date nights and they don't have sex. Of course they do. But the focus shifts and it's healthy for the focus to shift. It's healthy for the focus to shift on what your general life meaning is going to be. Having a close relationship is one thing, one thing, one aspect of your life. And when it becomes the sum total of your life, that's when things become incredibly codependent and enmeshed. And, uh, most human beings want a greater mark on the world than saying that they had a good sex life. And so then there can be kind of this disconnect between women that want to move into the next stage of their life and men who are very, very focused on staying young and almost staying in that prior stage where it's intimacy versus isolation. So the man is trying to plan all these dates and have sex like, you know, Uh, exciting sex and even like bring toys in and kinky and all this stuff and she's like kind of almost not that she articulates it quite this way some women do somewhat but it's like okay so I have a couple orgasms like that's what I did today you know like that's going to be like the sum total of like this experience like in a best case scenario (laughs) that's the experience you know and sure you could feel close and you could feel fun and adventurous and I talk a lot about things that sex can do But within the backdrop of, uh, so let's say your sex life is fine. You know, I have a podcast that says your wife doesn't need your sex life to be mind blowing. And as long as it's basic level, like, okay, we do connect, we do feel close, sex is a part of our marriage, then many women do not have the uh, desire to somehow go above that to making this a, a key focus of your life together. Some couples do. Some couples get involved in the lifestyle and they do all sorts of, you know, things and swinging and poly and and this kind of does become a focus. Although with poly couples, it is more of a meaning making in that they are having love relationships with other people as well. And it's also kind of very community based, you know, poly people are friends with other poly people, etc. But in general, it is interesting and common for couples to come in and one person and it can also be the other gender so the woman is focused on can we do date nights can we do couples vacations can we do all these cute things you're not romantic enough and the guy's like I'm trying to like basically build a huge business that will be like a legacy and generational wealth etc I mean I don't know about you know date night tonight you know I I have things I have things going on I love you I want to be close to you but like kind of his eyes are on a a bigger, uh, it's a wider lens. And certainly there are plenty of people who are just literally doing this for money and then the woman looks down on it. But many people are not. You know, having a career is obviously beyond making money. So yes, if he's picking just to, you know, literally make money over hanging out with her, then that's not a deeper sort of midlife awakening sort of motivation. But many people are building a career you know, and when they're building a career, male or female, there are lots of moving parts and it seems to coalesce into something in your mind that's going to be bigger than yourself, that's going to, you know, help people in some sort of way, or at the very least, 
help your children, help your children be situated, make sure that you don't have, they don't have to accrue massive debt or you can help them with college or you can buy them a house or whatever's important to you. So these are the sort of conversations that are really, really interesting for couples to have. Have you, you know, moved, and I have a post that's going to be coming out about this or maybe will have come out. I don't know which one it's written, but you know, I've got like a backlog <laughs> like I do with these uh, podcasts, but probably at the same time around as this, you know, I have a whole post on kind of how marriage changes at midlife. People's desire, sexual desire goes down. Their desire for both. And if you think it doesn't for men, then I have plenty of podcasts for you. The only bad, you know, why men nowadays don't think that drive goes down in ma- in with age and in marriage. And you can listen to that podcast. But basically, the whole like obsession with yourself goes down. For a lot of women, that's awesome. You're not like so fixated on your body, your weight every second, how you look in the mirror every second, you know, because your hormones have, have gone down a bit. And for men, it usually happens this exact same sort of way. They have more self-deprecation. They have more humility. They're not self-obsessed. When you're an adolescent, there's healthy adolescent narcissism, and that kind of peaks out at adolescence, and then it's supposed to kind of go down over time. And that's what doesn't happen for some people some people just get obsessed with staying young and staying in in earlier developmental stages often because and they don't realize this or think about this because their needs were not met at a very early stage such as they never felt good enough as a kid so then they were never able to date and then they always felt like a late bloomer and then now in their marriage they're basically trying to live out their 20s and 30s even in their 40s and 50s and I have a whole podcast and posts on late bloomers and that epitomizes what I'm talking about here but for healthy couples in midlife there is a natural lack or lessening of a focus on self and fleeting happiness and a larger focus on how are we making the world a better place how are we doing something bigger than ourselves how are we contributing to things that are not just us feeling temporary pleasure in whatever way you know and sometimes people are at different places with that and one wants to let's say volunteer a lot and the other just wants to you know hang out and focus on having like a better love life or sex life or one person is very focused on going to the gym to make themselves look and feel better and the other person isn't as focused on their self they are focused on work or they let's say work with people or help people or focused on the children's development or what have you and yeah it would be really great to say that everybody can balance everything and that you can both you know go to the gym every day and have sex every day and go on date night every day and be an awesome parent and be great at work but the reality is there's only 24 hours in a day and so people make different decisions on how you spend your time really is reflective of deeper priorities so it is and I see this often it is hard for a woman who let's say is very involved in building her career you know um and parenting to super respect a guy whose main goal is a triathlon you know and that's kind of what he does like all the time is obsessively trained because she thinks of him as very self-oriented almost as though he's at a younger stage of development and he may perceive of her as maybe not self-oriented enough and certainly not in as good shape sometimes as him and and there these are people with kind of different values i mean some some guys are and many guys interestingly are the triathlon plus the big career guys because they're just the guys who have like a hell of a lot of energy more of the ceo type that i talk about but a lot of things in life are zero sum. That is reality. So if somebody, let's say, is going to the gym all the time and then the other person is like volunteering with like the elderly or these people that are on the same page in midlife, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they can learn to, uh, you know, learn from one another and get to a place in between where both of kind of the values are, are endorsed and neither one is judged. But this, you know, this midlife is a real interesting place for marriage. And this is a time when a lot of couples come in to figure out ultimately if they're compatible or if they are growing in different directions or if, you know, they aren't. And and this is also closer, obviously, to when children leave the house and divorce starts to seem like a possibility for couples if they had been very child-focused, etc. So either way, 
it's something interesting to think about is these stages, which stage are you in if you are in your 40s? Which stage do you, did you, how did you see your parents navigate this switch, this change, you know, from the intimacy versus isolation, who will love me, to the generativity versus stagnation of how will I contribute to the world? A lot of people uh, are subconsciously either copying their parents' template of midlife or they're railing against it. So a lot of the guys who are obsessed with the gym, it's because they basically felt that their passive father kind of faded out of his own life in his 40s and really just worked and came home and sat on the couch and was kind of not very fulfilled, not very dynamic, not very alive. So they may be going to the gym and their wife thinks that they're being super shallow, but in reality, they feel that their father um, they're trying to not be like their dad who just kind of wasn't even was a cipher, you know, and the way that they're choosing to do this is going to the gym. And, and if that man was in uh, individual therapy, he could kind of understand his motivations and maybe do more stuff, you know, that isn't just the gym. That is something bigger, building something bigger, uh, giving back to the community or what have you, which would also solve the same issue of not being like the passive father if that had been identified as a subconscious motivating variable, which it is hard to identify when you're living it and you're not in therapy talking about it. But anyway, this would be a good one to talk to your spouse about, and I hope you got something out of it, and I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day, guys.